Curtis Chen, uh, the producer of this film. I just want to introduce him very quickly. We're a little bit behind schedule, but what I want to do is just let them see you there, and then uh, he'll be part of our second presentation, uh, part, the second part. So anyway, thank you so much. So we are going to begin our live streaming, right? David, we've already opened up, right? So what I want to do is I first want to welcome our live streaming guests. Uh, and uh, particularly those people over there in uh, Salt Lake City who are um, who are also, uh, uh, we'll mention them again because they are an important part of what Corky tried to do. In this <laughs> <laughs> do you guys eat dinner or something? <laughs> so anyway, I just want to say a few things. My name is Ted Gong. I'm the executive director of the 1882 Foundation. Uh, we are a 501c3 organization, which is uh, designed to talk about, remember the 1882, the significance and history of the 1882 exclusion laws. And one of the things that we have done lately is uh, uh, combined, we've actually for the last couple of years worked very closely with the MLK Library. I think one of the great things that actually happened during the last several years was uh, during the uh, uh, not because of the pandemic, because of the renovations of the MLK Library, they actually took a greater effort to come out and meet the community. I love this. I love this direction in which we're going with more of the, more of the library, our institutions, our community are working together. And so, David, I want to thank you and Maggie and the whole crew, the uh, of, of the DC Public Library, and so particularly MLK Library. What a really beautiful beautiful place this is. <clears throat> you want to learn more about the 1882 Foundation, please go outside, pick up one of our brochures, and talk to one of our people who will tell you everything you want to know about what we do. Um, I also want to take this time to uh, mention, um, uh, mention that a couple of our, a few of our supporters who we would not be able to be here unless, uh, without their support. Among them, very key is like, OCA Asian American Advocates from the very beginning has been one of our partners for 1882 Foundation. Chinese American, uh, the uh, Chinese American Citizens Alliance has also been a key partner for us for the last 10, 10 years, right, along with OCA. Also, we have uh, United Chinese American, and we also have the Chinese uh, Community Church, uh, particularly the Chinese Service Center. Uh, JACL has also been people that supported our programs. Uh, but for this particular program, we are also very thankful for Panda Express, which actually helped finance some of our programs, this particular series of programs. And particularly this particular program, we are very thankful to be a uh, partner with the Asian American uh, Journalist Associations. Uh, where is uh, Mariah? Is she here? There she is. <laughs> OK, uh, so we'll get you down here in a short while. But before we do that, uh, and we're going to bring the rest of the panelists here. Uh, Mariah will will introduce the rest of the panelists. A great a great group of people. A lot of fun people, I think. And uh, the thing about we also have my wife is wandering somewhere. 
where she was going to pass out cards for people. If you have questions, please write them down and then we'll pass them down and I'll try to introduce it into your conversation uh, when we start the programming. Uh, also, for those people who are online, use the chat function. Try to use as much as you can and we'll try to introduce those, interject them into the conversation as well if we can. But before we start, I also want to point out that today is, uh, you know, I, I, I wanted to say that so many people knew Corky personally. He had so many friends and so many people uh, that work with him. I, I can't say that I was a really close friend of him, his, but we were in the doing many things together and he would always be here being ready to record our histories, uh, make sure that uh, we uncovered our histories and also to help shape the interpretations of our histories. Today is May 10. We purposely chose this day because it's the anniversary of the completion of the first transcontinental railroad. And one of the things I remember Cor Corky talking about before the pandemic was, I am going to record, do a flash mob sort of thing at the Promontory Point, Promontory Summit in Utah where the two railroads came together on May 10. And he would show that he would take pictures of descendants of the Chinese railroad workers who were not allowed to be part of that, that, that original uh, picture in 1869. So he did that each of the several years. I think many of you guys might have actually been there at Promontory and had been part of that, that, that experience. So I think it's appropriate for us, and, I, and before I do that, I wanna give a shout out to all those people over in Utah who are doing a Zoom party with us. Uh, <laughs> and uh, they will have something to say toward the end of the program as well. But uh, before we get into this, I think it's appropriate for us to start with some additional film that we have from Kenneth Ng, also one of the film, um, the film, uh, um, filmmakers, the film, film, <laughs> anyway, the camera people and film producers for the last, uh, the Dear Corky, Dear Corky feature, but he also captured a number of interviews and talks with Corky at Promen The contributions of Chinese to the, the building of America starts with the railroad. It's forgotten because it doesn't show up in a photograph. Beginning with the first thing that I learned about Chinese in American history is that they built the railroad. Yet when I looked at the photograph, I didn't see any Chinese. But uh, I knew that there were Chinese. So when I got the opportunity on the 145th anniversary, uh, I resolved to organize a flash mob to debunk the myth that Chinese did not exist building the railroad. And it turns out of the 200 plus, according to the newspapers, there was six descendants of railroad workers. That recognition took 145 years. For the official photograph, people are gonna have to be on the inside of this flagpole here. If you're beyond the flagpole, you're not gonna be in the frame. They can write about what took place but the photographs would actually substantiate or be photographic proof that so-and-so took place. Anybody who's not in place yet, go further back. I figured if a picture's worth a thousand words, I could say a whole lot with one photograph. The motivation was to get the images out there for mainstream public to, to see that the Chinese in America are basically part and parcel of everything else that is American. Nowadays, there's a lot of misperceptions and misconceptions about the Chinese immigrant. And I think that if I were able to show them in a three-dimensional manner as opposed to a single stereotype, it would be beneficial to all parties concerned.
I'm not a photographer, but I connect with Corky in a lot of ways. Uh, I met him several times at Asian American Journalists Association conventions. And when I was a very broke journalist. I'm not journalist, a photographer, but I connect with Corky in a lot of ways. Uh, I met him several times at Asian American Journalists so yes, when I was very broke, um, I purchased a, a Corky Lee print because um, it was a photo of, he called them, he called the photo Lola's. It was grandmothers who were doing a traditional Filipino dance in Queens. And that was the first time I had ever seen a photograph of Filipino Americans that really, that like represented us um, as Filipino Americans. So it was really powerful for me. Um, we have actual photographers here. Um, we have Sharon Huang, who is a Cantonese photojournalist based in DC, whose work focuses on politics, immigration, human rights, diaspora experiences, and the interactions in between. Kent Nishimura is a photographer with the Los Angeles Times DC Bureau with a storied career freelancing and working at several national and international publications. Francis Chung is a DC based photojournalist whose work has appeared in Politico and ENE News. Uh, Jim Giordano, Jim, it's Joe. oh, Joe, <laughs> okay, um, <laughs> Joe Giordano is a Baltimore-based photojournalist and educator and co-host of the photojournalism podcast 10 Frames Per Second, and you all know um, Curtis Chin, um, who made this film, but he also made another a really important film called Vincent Who, a film that aimed to raise awareness of the murder of Vincent Chin in Detroit in 1982. Um, but yeah, so I wanted to first start with a question for Curtis. Um, I know when we spoke before, you had you felt like you had a very interesting connection with with Corky. Like, how do you connect with him and his legacy? Um, thank you, uh, Ted and David and the library. Thank you to my listeners just for um, hosting this event. Uh, and thank you, guys, for uh, being the moderator. Um, In terms of the question. Uh, the connection with Corky. I actually met Corky uh, right after I moved to New York as a bright-eyed uh, recent college graduate, and um, you know, instantly uh, was like mesmerized by him and you know the knowledge that he had about the community and his commitment. And so, for from that point on, we stayed in contact for like over close to thirty years. Um, and so, in terms of the connection that I had with him, is that. Uh, I think for him, yes, he was a photographer, but first and foremost, he was a community activist and he used the knowledge that he had to really support the community. And I think that's something that I also have tried to do. And I learned that lesson from him is at the end of the day, you know, you develop these skills, whether it's writing or filmmaking or whatever, but it's in service of a larger cause, which is, um, you know, the advancement of the Asian American community. And I feel like in that sense, we were both um, kindred spirits. Does anyone else want to add anything? <laughs> Hi, how are you? Is it on actually? Hi guys, how are you? Welcome and thanks for joining us. Um, first of all, it's um, I feel so humble to be part of this panel along all this amazing journalists, you know, founders, especially Ken's and uh, Curtis and also um, Francis and I'm only like a like more than a year in this freelance market as a photographer so I'm like so humbled to be here and then just like to talk about the legacy of such a legendary Chinese American um, photographer so and also just thanks like AJ for this opportunity um, and of course the MLK library and also 19, 1882 foundation um, also, I would love to shout out to all my friends who are here to support, especially my mentors, Alex Wong and Robert Miller. Thank you for being here. You're supposed to be here talking, but like I'm part of this. Um, so I just wanted to say, like, I agree a lot with um, what Curtis just said that, you know, like every one of us is actually a community servant. Like we, we strive every day as a photographer, I mean, photojournalist to, to tell the best stories of we can especially about about you know asian community and this is one of the missions that i try to do every day like you know do my job and yeah i i would say that this is just what i want to say about this film and and of course like 
each one of us is continuing um, Curtis' legacy um, as such a great photographer. And I, I look at his work back in school when I was in Syracuse, and um, and I was just thinking one day I want to be like him. And here I am still learning and growing every day. So next, it should be Kent. <laughs> hey, everyone. Um, I mean, just kind of echoing what was already said. Like, I, I met Corky at a, at a couple of the AAJ conventions, and I was always so, like, impressed with, like, just the, the body of work that he had and seeing, you know, um, Asian Americans represented in it because I think, you know, it, it's – it's kind of interesting looking at like the history of photojournalism and thinking about how um, predominantly like, especially like Western outlets, like, you know, like the big newspapers and wire services and how they send correspondents all across the world to cover the news. And it's largely from a very Western male white perspective and seeing, you know, people who look like me, who, 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 you know, who have similar backgrounds or, or cultural um, backgrounds like, like me and like us um, reflected in Corky's work was always just really kind of incredible and inspiring. And, and, and you know, I, I met him when I was an intern at, um, at the LA Times and it, it was just really kind of neat to see that and see like somebody who looked like me, who's, who's you know, who, liked similar food, who liked, who had very similar interests to, to me, you know, and see their work out there in the world was, was really kind of inspiring. And so I think, I think um, what was really kind of cool, I think, seeing, you know, with like other Asian American photographers here and seeing, you know, who also like have kind of like inherited Corky's will um, of documenting, not just, you know, the Asian American community, but also just the, our community in general. And and, and their communities in general, and and being able to to put forth those stories, I think is really really kind of cool and very important. And I feel like I'm rambling, so I'm going to pass it along to somebody else. Yeah, actually, Joe, I wanted to ask you. You're an educator. What do you teach your students about Corky? Um, why is his, he part of your curriculum? No, I'm, oh, sorry. I'm, I have a big mouth anyway. I don't really. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, it, it's very interesting. Um, when Quirky passed away and I saw the obituary in the New York Times, um, I, I put him into our uh, curriculum. I, I try to do a, a photo history that's kind of an alternative history where it's not just the white beardy guys. We, I kind of get, get on them real quick and then they're done. Um, because I, I've found that um, you know, for every white beardy guy, there's someone who hasn't been mentioned like throughout photo history. I mean, it, it's almost like a parallel history. So we do that. Um, and Quirky fits in that in, in the civil rights, you know, the civil rights photography of the, the 60s and especially the, the 70s. Um, and I'm also, I'm a full-time photojournalist as, as well as uh, teaching at Baltimore School for the Arts. I teach black and white analog um, photography. So we get the film stuff. Uh, I can't wait to show this documentary. We talked about it. <laughs> I, I was pretty much begging to get this into my class so I could, so I can show it. Um, but I, I think it's interesting, and it falls on educators now to keep this going. Um, I checked during the, the film. I, I wasn't going to check my phone, but I checked Amazon, and it's really strange. Corky's name comes up on Amazon, but he doesn't have a book. So obviously someone searches for his name a lot because it came up as soon as I, I typed it in. Um, we need to get a grant or something and really get a nice photo book uh, of of Quirky's work, but um, as an educator, yeah, it's I I mean he you know falls into that the, the civil rights category and the, um, the the communities that just didn't or weren't shown you know like you just said because it's I mean it's a white male run media essentially and and that's the um, that's kind of the the narrative and it's still it's still going on out there um, you know as a photojournalist I don't uh, I try not to parachute in anywhere I pretty much stay in Baltimore. Um, I haven't been to Ferguson. I, I shoot for like the Guardian. I mean, I do a lot of assignments, but I don't, you know, what, what do I have to say in Ferguson, right? Like, you know, other than like, you know, dropping in with my, my scarf, you know, and my long lens and then dropping back out again. So I, I, I my point is I really instill that in my students. And I think the importance of Quirky's work is that you need that voice from inside of these communities. And I think it's good for students to, to see that. Uh, I work with uh, Devin Allen. Anyone know Devin? 
but okay. Yeah, so Devin comes and talks to my class. He and I are good friends. And this is what we talk about. He doesn't leave Baltimore either. He's he sticks to there and we 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 both shoot from the inside out. And we kind of stand by that. Um, and I think that's what the importance of Corky's work is. Just a quick update. Uh the the family actually announced that uh I think Random Random House is actually coming out with a Corky Lee book. Uh, oh, nice. they announced it uh, you know, on the one one year anniversary of his passing. So I know they're working very, very hard on um meeting the schedule for that. So a spot on my book. It will be a, a big book. Yeah, I was wondering if you could talk about how Corky's work has influenced what you do. Sure. Um I think in terms of um, having Asian American stories told that previously hadn't been told and told from an inside perspective, insider from the community itself um, was important in a sense that it avoids some of the kind of exoticization or kind of, I don't know what, the orientalizing um, that Sometimes the, uh, the subjects that Corky depicted were uh, had imposed on them by, say, white male, um, even colonializing um, perspectives. So I think that's um, just to piggyback on some of what you said. But I think maybe one thing we haven't talked about yet that I'm very struck by is just the aesthetic quality of his work. So to have Asian American images captured from within the community is in it itself an important. Um, achievement for its day, especially from that era uh, when not a lot of that was happening. But to have the images captured with such technical and aesthetic brilliance was also um, an, an, an added bonus. And in, uh, we're lucky to have that. Um, I mean, I think some things that strike me when looking at his images, like, uh, and everyone may be able to articulate this in ways I can't, but uh, Corky had an incredible sense of rhythm in terms of composing his images, where kind of human figures and bodies and limbs kind of dance around the frame and uh, with a great sense of depth also leading in, in, into, into deeper space. Um, he had an incredible way of working with text that also was rhythmic and like wasn't trite the way, you know, like I might just generically use text from a Supreme Court. Um, protest that's going on now just to illustrate what's going on he made it a he made text not only informative what was going on but a part of the formal composition in a, in a really impressive way I mean, just to see those things takes a lot of talent and then to, you know have the skill to actually compose and capture a, a picture like that is um uh to to his enormous credit and one thing, I, just in terms of what I admire and am influenced by, I, I think he's, he was a great uh, environmental portraitist. Uh, we saw some of the ones um, up there, like the uh, woman boxer. Uh, I don't know if you'd call the taxi driver an environmental portrait. There, there are a number of ones that probably aren't uh, coming to mind. I don't remember the titles. But also, I think those he, he, uh, were not only very well lit and well composed, but uh, he was able to endow a lot of dignity on those subjects and just getting back to my original point, just avoiding that like exoticization, you know, that othering that sometimes maybe those subjects might have been um, uh, portrayed with by um, a different, um, someone with a different eye and a different perspective. So I guess off the top of my head, those are some things. Uh, that's really great, especially for those of us who are not photographers and wouldn't necessarily see that. I wanted to ask you all where you think, how you think the media is doing, news media is doing in terms of its portrayal of uh, AAPI communities. <laughs> Woo! <-hoo>! Um, <laughs> in terms of photography, I mean, I certainly have lots to say about how <laughs> how they're doing um, on the text side, but I'm interested to know where you think they fall short, where they do well, and and maybe what what lessons Corky has for the broader mainstream media. I will say one thing that I did notice very early on in the pandemic at the start of it was a lot of the photography used to illustrate stories about COVID were always like masked Asian Americans. And I remember um, seeing, um, and and I, 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 
how do I put it? Like, I don't think there's any like, I think it's more just like an institutional failure in the sense of the fact that it's, there's no malice in it. There's no, it's just an, maybe an ignorance or, or an un, uh, ignorance to like how the optics of, of it appear. Um, because, you know, maybe on the wire, you know, a, a digital editor might see like, oh, hey, here, like I just typed in mask in our system and this is what comes up and they just slap it on the stuff without any, any care or, or, or consideration for how it might look or how it might appear. And especially because of where like it originated from and a lot of the stuff is coming out of like it, the way that it was portrayed because of that and, and further that stereotype, I think was something that, that was definitely an issue very early on. And I know a lot of news organizations, ours included, like did make a very conscious effort to try and course correct on that and be more um, cognizant of how we, 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 you know, attach images or how we portray things in those situations. Um, I don't know if that answered the question yeah. at all. No, that's but. really helpful. What about Joe? You seem to have something to say. I always do. Um, <laughs> yes, it's racism. Sorry. I, I, um, no, well, it just happened last week. There was a New York Times piece, uh, uh, had nothing to do, it, it was COVID numbers somewhere, and it was in you know, an, an Asian American person in a mask. And I, I retweet, I tweeted that out. Like, you know, we have to stop this. I was a photo editor, Baltimore city paper for four years. So I've been on the editorial side of it. And these are conscious things that draw people to click and to look at these photographs. And it's just infuriating when I saw that last week. Um, and of course, a whole bunch of people jumped on it on Twitter, rightly so. But I, I think that it's still this, um, you know this this i don't know the editors but it, there's there's just so much of it that, it that it seems to be like when you type mask in you get more than just one type of person in a mask you know it's, it's a conscious thing because they know that eyes are going to go to that and they know that you know unfortunately the former what's his name uh you know put this this association in people's heads across the country and i, I think editors know that and I, I think they want people to click on these stories and they put these pictures in there like for that reason and I, i'm glad that like la times is like you know kind of maybe doing a self-examination of it because i think that has to be done structurally across the board and i point this out to my students like you know like all the time um Baltimore, right? If you see a story about Baltimore, if it's not John Waters, it's abandoned, right? It, it's abandoned. It's the wire, right? Those are the only two stories that ever come out of Baltimore, and it's just it's infuriating. So when someone you know types an abandoned building, Baltimore comes up, and there's always a Baltimore picture attached to some story like that. So I think these editors really need to to rethink and have a sit down with their agencies and their photographers to kind of change this image that's out there, you know, in the in the media. I was yeah I I think there's still a way to go but I always try to look at the glass half uh, full um, and my comparison would be another uh, seminal moment in Asian American history which is the Vincent Chin case um, back in Detroit where I'm from I was a teenager a 14 year old at that time and one of the most frustrating things um, in terms of the coverage of that was I was always on the lookout for stories about the Vincent Chin because we were family friends my uncle was his best man I was like you know, thirsting, you know, for, for images and stories about it. But the only thing I, I, we ever got, or the majority of the stuff was stories about the two killers or the impact, you know, of, of the auto industry and people losing their jobs. Every story seemed to be connected to that image, right? And very, very few images of the impact on the Chinese American or Asian American community. But now flash forward to the recent rise of hate crimes. I think that there is a better job done. Maybe partly because um, these newsrooms are a little bit more sensitive. I don't know because I don't work in that industry, but my sense is they're a little bit better. But I think also more importantly, you know, we have new technology where, where people of color, you know, have cameras and we are documenting things and that's forcing the newsrooms to sort of change because I don't think that we'd be as far if people weren't photographing things like the George Floyd murder or like, you know, when Asian Americans are attacked on the street. So I think it's that citizen journalism that's also, you know, um, you know, giving us more power to sort of force those uh, newsrooms to change. So. Yeah, one thing I think, you know, for all the negativity that Twitter brings into the world, it also brings accountability because as soon as a photo goes up that's inappropriate or what was the one recently where Ali Wong is getting a divorce and they had a picture of her with Randall Park, who is not her husband. Yeah. So it looked like she was leaving her husband for Randall Park, which is not also not happening. <laughs> um, 
and people jumped on it right away. And I, I think that, you know, there's a certain power in that collective voice and us being able to be like, this is BS. Um, yeah, I mean, what kind of lessons do you think Corky would have for the mainstream media? Like how, how can we use his legacy to do a better job or is, or is what he did like so far from, you know, mainstream news coverage that it's, it's hard to join those two. Well, I, I think one of the things, um, because I feel like, because Francis and Kent are full times, for me as a working Asian woman, freelance photographers in DC, I've always have hard time pitching stories about Asian stories or Asian experiences stories. And like, really, like I work with so many publications from day to day and um, it's really hard for me to find an Asian photo editor in DC. Um, and even I find one, <laughs> I just stick with that person for a longest time to try to push as much as, as many as Asian stories out. Um, I think this is a like how to address this question, like how to address this problem is really like to let I, I think the organization needs to think like how can they try their best to elevate that diversity within, within their photo department team. Um, like all those big organizations that I work with in DC and 99% of the photo editors I work with from day to day are white men. So I don't know if we don't, if the organization don't adjust this structure problem, how can we move forward as a community itself. Um, plus, you like you mentioned about this, um, you know, how's uh, media doing in terms of covering Asian community? Um, that's one line for me. It's always struggling. It's like they mention so much about Asian American experiences, but for me, I'm not Asian American. I'm Asian. I would I came to the states as an international student. And there are so many friends here who have worked so hard to get the visa to stay here, but still serve the community as a photographer. And that line has been always so, so blurry in mainstream media, which I think they need to also figure out ways to, you know, address that problem too. Um, so I would say to advance this in community itself, it's like, it's really hard, like for me, I am struggling financially, try to pick up daily assignments every day. Meanwhile, still wanted to spend time outside of my daily assignments to work on personal projects about Asian experiences. And it's hard. I feel like it's a struggle that we need to pick. It's like a battle that I work on every day <laughs> that I have to pick one thing out or another. Good. Yeah. Do any of you all have a project or a a photo even where you felt like, oh, this is getting to the core of what, what I want to do. This is getting to the core of what, um, like this is following in Corky's path. Sorry to put you on the spot. Also shout out your Instagram handles. <laughs> Well, this is photojournalism, but I can do a shameless plug for yeah. <laughs> something I'm working on. Uh, so I am uh, lucky enough to have sold my memoir um, called Everything I Learned, I Learned in a Chinese Restaurant. It's about growing up in Detroit, uh, being Asian in a very black and white world, but then also coming out in my working class uh, immigrant family. So uh, I feel like, you know, um, hopefully there's some wisdom in there all things that I learned from my family working as much as 80 hours a, a, a week in, in that family business. So that we sold it to Little Brown and that's coming out in the fall of 2023. So, um, you know, hopefully that, that goes well. Everybody buy a copy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think for me, it's it's a little different just because I am a I am on staff at a newspaper, and so a lot of my work is predominantly um, for the needs of the paper. I mean, staffing the DC bureau and covering the White House and the Hill, and and even when I was based in LA, I would do more. I mean, the nice thing about being based in LA is like it's it was such a 
there was such a wide variety of things to do in ter- and communities to cover, which was, was really great. And I always like took delight every time I got sent into the 626 or into the, you know, the San Gabriel Valley, because one that meant I could also get like great food because I was like, oh yes, I can go get Chinese food today. That's great. <laughs> um, but um, I think for me, um, and you know, you can follow me on Instagram at Kent Nish. A lot of my stuff is politics right now, but that's just what I do. Um, um, I think kind of getting back to your original question, um, I think um, something, I guess that that's the, for me, it like when I was, I'm originally from Hawaii. And so we have a fairly large Asian population there and being able to cover my home state and, and really tell stories about the community that really helped me informed like informed me who informed who I am as a photographer and and I'm kind of getting off the rails here and lost track of the <laughs> um but um that for me like being able to do that I think is at, at the core of like what photojournalists do like embedding themselves within the community and being able to tell stories about you know people who let you into their lives and whose paths you cross and how that all kind of intersects within the larger community i think was really really at, at what interested me in photography and i resonated with like corky's work because i saw that even though it was just very in some sense very focused on just the asian community whereas like in hawaii it's like a larger melting pot of asian you know asian pacific islanders and and everything else Oh, uh, one other thing that um, I don't know if you mentioned that uh, you actually saw when you know the film was playing was he actually spoke Toisanese, um, one of the dialects, Toisanese, right? Yeah. Um, I find that so powerful that because I can speak Cantonese and Mandarin and Korean, that I can apply this language into communities, Asian communities that don't like a lot of people, a lot of immigrants in those communities don't speak English that. All that much. So I feel like as a photographer with this language skills, I can provide a, a safe space for them to express themselves in their native languages. Um, and plus, I think one other thing that really struck me about Corky's work is he is so good at photographing Asian women's vulnerability. And he is also paying attention to connecting communities together in his, his storytelling. Because there was one picture was about Chinese American protests, right? And then he purposely framed this black man in the back to connect to community, knowing that, you know, historically, I mean, historically, black and community tension is, has been never soft. It's been going even worse after the pandemic started. So I feel like this little nuances that he applies in his storytelling is what I strive for every day in my own photography work. Yeah, just as a non-photographer, one of the things that I really appreciate about his work um, is that he did he basically flipped the trope on its head. We ha- we saw all these photos of Asian Americans standing up for their rights, protesting, being getting angry, not being docile, um, and even said, "We are not docile," and also doing a wide variety of jobs. Um, I think a lot of people forget because Asian Americans overall do very well that something like one in five. Uh, Chinese people in New York City live in poverty. So we have this huge middle class community. um, And I often feel like our communities don't get covered with the same kind of texture. Um, And I think Filipinos typically just are forgotten, even though we're the second or third largest Asian group. We can talk about that later. Um, (laughs) But yeah, you were going to add something. Oh, I, I, um, I, um, one of the things I noticed that I thought was fantastic was the um, the photos of the labor movement, um, which is really important to the history of both photography and civil rights photography. And like what's happening now with Amazon building unions and things, we're seeing more labor photography. Um, I'm working on a, a long-term project on the collapse of the steel industry, an international project. Um, and I see a lot of the same type of faces that were in Corky standing up for their workers' rights. Um, and I, it's, it's, a, it's very strange to be living in a, a country that's going to the right, but 
the the left is really kind of like the, the unions are kind of bouncing back a little bit. And I, I was really drawn to that with his work of the of the strikes um, and the workers. I thought that was really important to bring the workers front and center uh, in, in the photographs. Um, yeah, that's that's what I, I took away. And I, I really um, I, really, I was really drawn to that. I'm not sure what the exact direction of the conversation is right now, but I just getting right. I forgot yeah. the question. <laughs> but I guess just I think this relates to some of the things we're talking about. It's hard to what you asked earlier about was there a, a moment when I thought I was doing something akin to what Corky might have done or uh, approach that. And it, it's hard to say yes, because, um, you know, first of all, like Kent, you know, I'm mostly covering politics where Asian Americans and Asians are incredibly underrepresented on the Hill and everywhere. Um, other beats I've covered, uh, like sports, music, um, also the same. So I've never been embedded in the community the way he did. And also there's an interesting, I think, question that I'd be curious to hear the other panelists thoughts on also. He, you know, in the film and elsewhere, he describes himself as an activist and we are photo, we're journalists or I am. And it's interesting to think about the relationship between the two and, or is, is, is there one, what, what, what's the line of that and what might someone like Corky be having an influence today? Because there are kind of activist journalists out there you run into them all the time at protests and you know they're embedded with the groups often the groups often want to be represented by them and they do not often or sometimes want to be represented by the so-called mainstream media um so i don't know there's just some thoughts that i think it's an interesting um it's a thing to contemplate. Like what what uh, what is the relationship between activism and journalism, both in Corky's work, in general, and maybe today in in an in an environment where everyone does have photo gear or image capturing gear. There's Twitter. There's ways of doing it without having to go through a gatekeeper function of the traditional press. Um, so I don't necessarily have an answer to that, but it's I think it's an interesting. Um, a lens through which, another lens through which to kind of co contemplate or reconsider Corky's work. Yeah, I wanted to say that's happening more broadly in journalism. Like we're expected to be objective and now we're finally starting to interrogate what objectivity means. And it typically might, means what does not offend white sensibilities. Um, and I think we're finally able, that is a form of activism in, in a way because reinforcing the status quo is a is a you have to consciously do that um so yeah I, I think it's really interesting that i think there's a growing tolerance or a space now for for people to be more forthright about their views and about standing up for who they are so that's it's interesting that that's also happening in photography um do we have questions from the audience What suggestions do you have for integrating multicultural education in K-12 schools? Oh, is that one for me? Um, <laughs> yeah. Was that, was that for me? Uh, I mean, it, it, it's pretty, you know, it's it, it's difficult. I, I, I mean, I'll take this. Um, it's, it's, it's pretty difficult for a number of teachers for what's going on in the teaching environment right now with this creeping fascism into schools, right? And I'm calling it what it is. I don't care if I'm an activist or not, it's what it is. Uh, they're trying to control the narrative by marginalizing other histories in this country to suit white students. I work in a space where I am at liberty to teach whatever I want as far as history goes. So I, I opt to try to integrate as much as I can of other narratives, other stories, other photographers into the into the history. And I think that's what needs to be done when you can, Keith, I mean, there's there's people legitimately losing their jobs in states for for speaking up, you know. Um, so it's going to get more and more difficult. But we have to fight that as educators. You know, we, we have to keep pushing and pushing. 
to, to teach that multiculturalism from K through 12. Um, so that's, I mean, that's the best I can say is just, is just, if you can, if you're able, please keep it up. Oh, yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, I think, and I think kind of tying into photography, just like, you know, for me, I think showing work like that, like, like Corky's work, for example, like that, that document, you know, underrepresented or just other communities that or communities that, you know, are within that larger area, wherever your school or whatever may be. And, you know, showing work by, you know, Asian, black, brown, you know, all, you know, photographers from walks of life. And this is just strictly with a photography thing and like showing their work and showing how they embed themselves in the community and the stories that they tell, I think is, is a great way to do that. And also, sorry. Oh, oh. Uh, you know, we're going to, I'm sorry. Oh, no, no. We do uh, have a uh, pressing its time. And there are a number of interesting questions. And I think that uh, uh, one of them, I think I want to give you an opportunity to talk about fellowship or scholarship you have, right? Or something you could also answer the question. What, is, uh, what are we doing about having supporting Asian Americans in the field of the profession? Something of this sort. Anybody can take that. Yeah, what are you doing, Ken? <laughs> um, well, the LA Times actually does have a fellowship. It's a one-year fellowship that is, um, it used to be called MetPro's uh, Minority Training Employment Program. And I was actually a MetPro fellow at the LA Times, which is how I got hired there. Um, and it was like a small class of students who, who either come from an ethnic minority or um, just like a minority. Like, um, I know we had people who came from like a more underrepresented classes, like, you know, with like either financial background or, or you know, um, sexual orientation as well. And, but um, that's one way that the paper was really trying to diversify its newsroom and, and get more, um, have its staff reflect the community that it covers. Because I mean, for a very long time, the LA Times was a very um, white cisgendered paper that, you know, covers, um, a city that is very, very diverse. It's, you know, large Hispanic population, significant Asian American population, and, and as well as a black population. And, and very much like the paper, the makeup of the staff did not reflect the community that it covered. And MetPro was a way to do that. And so we actually do have, I, I don't know where, where we are in, in the current process for selecting candidates and whatnot, but, you know, um, please look it up and, and apply. We're always looking for Candidates. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sorry. Oh, everybody should join the Asian American Journalists Association. I'm on the board, and I'm legally obligated to harass you all to join. Um, it's a great organization. Um, we there's also folks who are not journalists who join, or are former journalists who join. Um, we our chapter sort of re-energizing, um, but AJA is probably the reason I'm still in media. Um, and it's a really important, strong network of folks, including photojournalists. Um, should I tell a few of the folks about that? Yeah, hang on just a second. Uh, so after this event, we've got to close at 8. Uh, we have to close at 8 o'clock, but there's going to be a really neat barbecue or something like that that you guys are doing. It's actually a pub, pub, pub. But that's where you can come back. Want to be journalists and people want to know about some of the journalist's career and stuff. Can I invite them to be yeah. where you're going to be? Can you tell yeah, them? we're we're headed to Ubaya, which is a restaurant close to here, and I'm I'm allowed to buy a certain number of drinks for people. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm definitely coming. Thank yeah, you. I know. <laughs> um, All I heard was open bar. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I think I have a budget, so you want to get there early. Um, um, I want to talk about like the fellowship that I'm on. Um, it's International Women Media Foundation Fellowship I'm on. It's so good. Yeah, Jing right there, she works at all different places, including IWMF. If you have questions about fellowship, <laughs> ask her. She knows a lot about it. Um, yeah, this fellowship is amazing. Um, I was able to be paired with a mentor that I have been wanting to have for like years. And her name is Mei Yi Wong, an AP veteran photojournalist. Because it's so hard to find an Asian woman mentor in our 
photojournalism industry. And I was able to actually talk to her and and like we just like work on such amazing relationship together. So it's actually a fellowship open to journalists. I mean like women journalists of color from all sorts of mediums. You don't have to be a photographer to apply for it. It's a great fellowship. Are we going through our cards? I'm passing you guys the questions. Oh, uh, oh, oh, answer them. Okay. So is there, there was a moment at the top of the film that the original project was looking at the country's oldest kind of country. Right. Speak up. Okay. Hi, Michael. Okay. Uh, Sorry. Talking to the mic. Okay. Uh, there was a moment at the top of the film where the original project was looking into the country's oldest Chinatown communities. Were you always uh, intending to, um, for the original, uh, I can't quite read the handwriting, Corky's work like this? Or was there a moment during filming that inspired you to go deeper into his life work? Well, you know, we were following him for like a year, right? And so at some point, you know, you develop a bond with your subject. So actually, we have a lot of footage of him just talking about Chinatown and the, the changing imagery of Chinatown, the facade of Chinatown, because that's the part of it. Um, uh, and so we've, you know, when he passed, we thought, oh, well, we have all this personal stuff that we can form into it. So no, that, would, that was not our original intention. But when you spend so much time with someone, you get into these things. The other pieces that we have are like, you know, we covered Boston. You know, we had a housing person in Chicago. We had someone who was a political Political activists in, in San Francisco, we we're following a, a school principal. So each of them had a different theme, you know, and uh, Corky's uh, theme was more like from the artist's perspective, right? And how we represent, you know, the community. And so, um, no, uh, it wasn't our intention to include some of the, the more personal stuff. It just happened. So I actually wanted to, yeah. sorry, I actually wanted to quickly ask a question because. Um, you know, when I ran into Corky, I don't think he would remember me. He was just a fixture at conventions, very revered. Everybody knew he was, he was a luminary. Can you talk about his personality? He, I kind of recall that he was a funny guy. Um, <laughs> what was he like as a, as a person? <laughs> Cranky? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, you, you know, he was a really genuine guy. I mean, you know, like he obviously had beefs. I mean, but, you know, he's an activist at heart and he's got a political perspective. Um, you know, our politics tend to align. So I was never uh, on the receiving end of some of his his barbs. But, um, yeah, no, I, I, uh, his heart was so into the community and he just really, really wanted the best, you know, and he tried to do his part in terms of bringing the community together, but also, you know, capturing the community's history because that was so important to him. And he was always just pitching different ideas of like, hey, let's do this, let's do that. You know, not just in terms of what to do with his photography, but like, hey, let's go to Nevada and like protest out in front of Ibn Zanissa's house. Oh, let's go, you know what I mean? So he just had a lot of different ideas and he was just really gung-ho about the community. Um, he had very high standards and expectations for the community, but that really came from his heart, I feel, you know, yeah. yeah. And one of the things that we do want to do uh, is that there is a message from us from, I said we started off with the idea that uh, today is May 10. And one of the things that Corky tried to do, one of the things that Corky actually do did was, was try to have this uh, 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 showing a promontory point that the uh, the legacy that he's left behind is not just that the railroads were there, the railroad workers were there and disappeared, they are here. And that's emphasized by the fact that he keeps going there, taking these photographs. Each time he takes goes there, then the crowd increases. So one of the things we start off is that it was good to make sure that we gave a great shout out to those people who are at uh, uh, Utah. And what I want to do is give a closing message from the Chinese Railroad Workers uh, Descendant Association. That's uh, Margaret Yee and also with uh, uh, Karen Kwan, right? Uh. Hi. Hi. I'm Representative Karen. Hi, I'm 
Representative Karen Kwan, and I'm so proud to be the president of the Chinese Railroad Workers Descendants Association after my late brother, Judge Michael Kwan. My name is Margaret Yi. I'm the co-founder and the chairperson of the Chinese Railroad Worker Descendant Association. We want to thank you for all of the volunteers and the organizers for the documentary and for the panel. What a wonderful event this has been. And we bring greetings from everybody here in the room, people from Utah and California together. Corky is our advisor, the CRWDA advisor. He inspired us. At the 145th anniversary, Corky come from New York and he is he he come talk to me. He said, I at the 150th anniversary, I want to see thousands of people, Chinese people there. Let's you and me work together. So I am going to do the fundraising in New York, and you're going to get the people. We're going to get one bus or few bus to fill up the people. Sure enough, he did that. We working together happily, and at the 150th anniversary, we have thousands of people from all over the world here and do the celebration, and we are so proud of that. At Corky. He's, he did a wonderful job for all of us. We miss him so much. You know, this mar year marks the 20th anniversary of the very first uh, uh, picture that he took, the photographic act of justice. Corky worked tirelessly for our communities. It's something that we could never step into his shoes and fill his shoes, but it's our job now to move forward and to fight against racism and discrimination and be seen as Corky wanted us to, to be. So we thank you all for this wonderful event and we hope to see you soon. We love Corky and we miss him a lot. We appreciate his support and passion and share his knowledge to our, so our history will never forgotten. Thank you. Thank you.